This past Friday night, we had a wonderful gathering at our home, which some of you attended. And there's some pictures on Facebook that Mary Margaret took for those of you that did not. It was a wonderful gathering, and it was co-sponsored by the Hispanic community organization Vosis Unitas. The celebration was called Las Pesadas, which means in Spanish, the ends. In Mexico, they celebrate this for nine days, and they go to homes in their neighborhood. Each night, they're singing the Las Posadas song, which is a um, request entry for Mary and Joseph, and then they are turned down at each home, being told that there's no room for them. Then, at the last door, they are welcomed in, and they enjoy a feast together. For our celebration on our property, we went to different doors, Mama's room, the storage shed where the lawnmower is, the Holy of Holies outhouse back by the labyrinth. We were singing the request in Spanish, some of us ood, then hearing the response from those that were inside the doors that there is no room. Finally, we ended up at our back screen porch and were welcomed in and sang joy to the world. We enjoyed our feast together, wonderful Mexican food, and other good food, and then the children had fun breaking the piñata. Although this ritual is a reminder of the story of Mary and Joseph looking for lodging, it doesn't exactly end the same way as that story does it. The Gospel of Luke tells us that Mary and Joseph were not welcomed in at an inn with a feast waiting for them, but they had to lay baby Jesus in a manger basically an animal feeding trough, because there was no room for them in the end. Now, Western civilization has whitewashed this manger scene, and I'm using that term intentionally and deliberately, to one with folks that have nice, clean clothes, standing around smiling at baby Jesus, and of course they're surrounded by shepherds, three wise men, and angels all at the same time. We've modified the story a little with our traditions, haven't we? Which reminds me of a little tale I heard many years ago. The Sunday school teacher had given the children a coloring sheet with just that picture on them for them to color in on a Sunday morning in December. One little boy, though, had added a character to the scene. Right by the manger, he drew a rather stout figure, kind of a friar tuck-looking man. And so the teacher saw that and said, Tommy... Who is that? And Tommy replied, Oh, that's Round John Virgin. <laughs> Round John Virgin, mother and child. <laughs> but this was not that scene. One would assume that the intention of this story was to indicate a very lowly, humble, probably smelly, difficult beginning for Jesus. Now, it's understandable that the innkeeper turned them away. The inn was full. But what if he had known that this baby would be one whose teachings would last for millennia? That this baby's birth would end up being so important that future generations would mark their calendars, A.D. and B.C., and divide them with that event. If the innkeeper knew, would he have reserved a room? or perhaps even vacated his own room for them? That's the no-room Bible story. What's the story for us? The late UU minister Roger Cowan asked his parishioners, why is so much of life like Bethlehem's Inn? Why does so much of love and goodness in our world, of hope and possibility, get shut out? The most obvious reason is that the inn was already full. Those who arrived first were served first. The innkeeper wasn't mean-spirited. Others got there first. The place was full, and that was that. By just such plausible, defensible circumstance, he says, personal enlightenment and spiritual growth get shut from our lives. Our mind space is given to other guests, and what gets our attention gets us. And that brings us back to our little experiment that we did with the children during the time for all ages. This is where you need to pay attention, parents. 
If our attention is on the sand and we fill up our jar with sand first, then there is no room for pebbles, much less the rocks. If the rocks represent things that are of primary importance in our lives, that which we may consider divine or sacred or ultra-significant, whatever word you want to use, then we need to put them in first. In the Christmas story, Jesus represents the divine, but was shut out of that inn and born in a stable. I again quote from Roger Cohen, who said, Most everything we treasure has been born in some sorry place, often rejected and shut out, with only a few persons wise enough to perceive the meaning. We need, he says, receptive hearts to see the holy when it comes knocking. The Reverend Cowan provides this warning. Time does more than pass. It narrows down our chances. The knock comes and is gone. Whoa, that's hard. It reminds me of a folk song by Harry Chapin. You know it. It starts out like this. My child arrived just the other day. He came to the world in the usual way, but there were planes to catch and bills to pay. He learned to walk while I was away, and he was walking for I knew it. And as he grew, he said, I'm going to be like you, Dad. You know I'm going to be like you. And the cat's in the cradle and the silver spoon. Little boy blue and the man on the moon. When you're coming home, Dad, I don't know when. But we'll get together then, son. You know we'll have a good time then. Of course, the song goes on to follow the child into adulthood with the father still promising to have a good time later. The tables are then turned when the son turns out just like his father after all and not having enough time for his dad as his father gets older. Just as there was no room for baby Jesus in the inn, there was no room for this father in the end. Folks, that father's relationship with his son should have been a rock. It should have been placed in the jar first. And I can go back in my own life and there are rocks I have failed to place in the jar of certain times before it was filled with sand. Which reminds me of the parable Jesus told of two builders. The wise one built his house upon a rock And the foolish one built his house on the sand, which soon shifted, destroying the house. We should make sure we build our houses, spending effort, spending time, spending resources on the rocks in our lives. Now, I also realize for sure that one can be focused on some aspects of some things we deem important in a sick and unhealthy way. Just spending time and resources on a relationship or with other areas of our life that we deem important is not enough if those time, that time and those resources are not well spent. I have had to learn this lesson myself over and over again in my own relationship with family members and in some other situations. Yes, I have been what folks refer to as an enabler. And I could be wrong, but I don't think I'm the only one here today who may have had this problem at some time in their lives. An enabler is defined by Webster as one who enables another to persist in self-destructive behavior like substance abuse by providing excuses or making it possible to avoid the consequences of such behavior. So please know that I'm not talking about just spending time and spending resources on the things that matter, but time and resources that are well spent and meaningful. Too often, though, that's not the problem. 
The problem is instead that we ignore things that really matter, caught up in the business of the world and our lives are distracted by other less important and meaningless activities, colorful sand. And like the dad in the song, we become too busy, 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 busy. If we could strive to simplify our lives, have less stuff and things to worry about and make payments on, then we could be present and receptive when those divine opportunities knock on our doors. Oh, but we are now in the midst of the holiday season, bombarded with messages that encourage us to buy more, not less, spend more time in frivolous activities, not less, drink more, not less, eat more, not less, it's a time of more, not amore. But a lot of it is simply sand that will fill up our time, our minds, and our lives, leaving no room for the sacred, the divine, those matters and those relationships that are of ultimate importance to us. Maybe I'm just a little too cynical this time of year and need to reframe my own thinking a little bit. Don Hawks, who is a United Methodist minister, he encourages his folks to enjoy the rush of Christmas. He says that uh, we should reframe the thinking in the words. Instead of fighting the crowds, he said that could be read as mingling with the holiday throngs. <laughs> Those harried chores and endless items to cross off our list can be easily read, he says, as joyful preparations and lots of fun stuff to do. Okay, I'll try, Don. And indeed, I do enjoy hosting groups at our home during this season of the year and trying to share some peace and joy. But I recognize that I don't want to get into the hassle and rush and spend money for gifts that are not needed. That's sand and pebbles to me. For this holiday season, and indeed for my life, I want to make sure that I have room for the rocks. What about you? What are the rocks that you want to be sure and have room for in your life? I'm going to hold up a few rocks for us to consider. So here's one. What does this represent for you? And here's another rock. What does this rock represent for you? Third beautiful rock here. What does this rock represent in your life? Since I have not perfected mind reading yet, I don't know what these rocks represent to you. But I can tell you that for me, this congregation, this faith tradition, and what we do together is a rock. And if it's not a rock for you, I challenge you to open yourself to that possibility. If you want to grow your soul and work to heal and nurture this world, you need a foundation for building. You need a rock. And for folks like us, Unitarian Universalism and this congregation is a mighty good one. Now, if that metaphor just doesn't work for you, perhaps it's a little old-fashioned or maybe a little too spiritually connected, <laughs> you want something more up to date, I'll give you one. There are a lot of us in this community who want to make a difference in the world and in ourselves, too, don't we? But we cannot do it alone, and we can't do it standing still. We need a vehicle. I'm not saying we're the only vehicle on the road that can get you there, but we're a mighty good one. One that doesn't tell you what you have to believe, one that is radically inclusive, one that challenges your mind and heart, 
one that promotes peace, justice, and compassion, and love for all, and one that has good coffee. (laughs) It's a beautiful bus headed for the beloved community. And there is room on the bus for you. Hop on board. Let's ride.